Welcome, everyone, to the Deep In Podcast. I'm Tom Trowbridge, um, your host. Thrilled to be here with Tom Firstner, who uh, founded the Riddle um, Network of Protocol. Um, and he is currently doing network design at the Riddle Foundation, the Lichtenstein Foundation. Um, with that, I want to turn it over to Tom to give us the uh, summary of what the Riddle Network is and what it's doing. Welcome, Tom. Uh, welcome, Tom. <laughs> uh, likewise, uh, happy to have me. So the, the Riddle Network is more or less one of the most inclusive, I would say, energy blockchains, which is addressing any kind of uh, uh, demographics. So, you know, individual users, prosumers, flexumers, but also companies and industries, yes, uh, up to the, I would say, grid management at the state level. So it's at the basic, it's uh, at its core, it's uh, simply a green deep in on top of Bitcoin. And it's there to more or less reward all participants which contribute uh, in one way or the other to the green transformation going on worldwide. Wow, it's an ambitious, um, ambitious project. How Can you explain a bit of how that works? And that, that may be getting into a lot of detail right away, but let's, uh, let, let's get into it. Yes. So <clears throat> uh, the green transitioning requires naturally a lot of data. Yeah, so the better the data are, are available to you, uh, the better you can manage uh, the new uh, grids and the new grid networks. So to guarantee this, uh, we, we solved one of the biggest issues. So the network operators, the grid operators, the infrastructure providers are blind behind the so-called smart meter. So they don't know what happens beside the smart meter. So they don't have the necessary, how can I say, uh, granularity of data with the necessary frequency or periodicity, and they don't have enough consistent data. So normal uh, 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 network operators get data once a day, sometimes once a week, sometimes once a month, bless you. And uh, um, this means if you want to use all the bells and whistles of uh, machine learning, AI, uh, new value generation, you're out of luck because you don't have the data. And uh, we address this by uh, more or less using new three or three new reference designs, which more or less give this visibility of data and aggregation of this data to everybody. So, so these three devices are, are one is called the so called tracker. It, it works with the billions of smart meters now around the world. You connect it to it and then you read the data from the smart meter, but you also read the data from everything behind the smart meter. This might be, I don't know, your individual consuming devices at your home, like uh, heat pumps, yes, or you have a solar rooftop uh, uh, and, and many more things. It can go down to a specific lamp. And then we uh, cross-reference this data and uh, uh, more or less we learn a lot from this. Uh, it helps especially to, to, to op optimize the network without being forced to completely rebuild the main grid. That's the, the most important topic. Then we have something we call energy agent. That's the intelligent wise at the edge. So it takes the data which come from the energy tracker and the smart meter. It takes the data of all your home IoT devices or industrial devices like electrolyzers. Yes. And then it more or less learns from this data. Yeah. And, and the last and most important thing is these two devices are held together by uh, an embedded hardware wallet. So every device we use is not only a data logger or a data meter, it's at the same time a full-fledged hardware wallet. So whatever you do and however you operate on the data, yeah, it's uh, constantly, how can I say, hardened by this hardware wallet, right? So the hardware wallet protects all the data we aggregate at rest in transit, even during computation on the one side. And when we have a transfer of data to different parties, for whatever reason, uh, we use this to more or less turn the energy data or the energy itself uh, into some kind, I would call it currency money or, or, or crypto money with attributes. Yeah. And this way we can build completely new incentive structures, financial instruments, which bridge this gap between DPIN, not DPIN, sorry, DeFi, and, uh, and the classical world of, uh, I would say, energy finance. And, and when you talk about collecting data, for those not as deep in the energy world as you, that data 
mean energy use? Is it on off? What what kind of data does that are you referencing there? Yes. So <clears throat> I told you we, we are very inclusive. So we have quite a quite diverse set of um, use cases. And what is very important, we do this already for three or four years. So uh, it's built, it's set up, it's operated, it runs. Yes. So this this network is fully active. Uh, first, first, and, and very uh, very easy thing. So you have a solar rooftop, yes, and you want to you know more about your solar uh, uh, energy distribution because you have to do constant. You have to take constantly decisions. So I I uh, I collect via the solar panels energy, and now you have three possibilities: you consume it directly, you store it in your battery, or you feed it back into the network. But this is dependent naturally on on uh, spot market prices or the price you get for net metering. So feed back into the network, you get some kind of subsidy. And this leads, for example, to a lot of interesting linear optimization problems. And as I told you, normally the smart meter data, as a regular user, you get them once a month at the end when you get the bill so for the settlement. But when you use our hardware setup and our blockchain infrastructure, you more or less have this data available in real time. So we can help you to decide, oh, now there is a, a very low price for your surplus energy. So put it into the battery. And then we can say, oh, there's a very high price on the spot market. Yes. So it's maybe better you feed whatever you have in surplus energy within your battery and put it to work uh, uh, as an investment, as net metering and put it back to the network. Or now don't put anything in the battery, don't put anything back into the grid, consume it as directly as possible. Yes. And this can become more and more complex. Super interesting. And so does that happen via an interface or does that happen directly? Um, how, how do consumers make those decisions? Where do they read or, or, or assess that, that information? Okay. So this is the point where it now gets very interesting. So I told you, we have this, uh, we have this energy agent, right? It's an edge device. It's quite powerful. Normally it's an arm, uh, 64, uh, bit architecture. So something which can really do complicated calculations uh, and computations. So this device runs the optimization process. This is the device which, uh, device which runs machine learning uh, uh, algorithms. And this device is more or less taking the decisions according to the learnings. And um, important is that for every energy consuming device you have at home or at the facility, we create for each and every device its own identity. We call this attestation against the blockchain. And then we also create a wallet for every device. So whatever the energy is, which goes or flows through these devices, it has a counterpart as a so-called tokenized energy. And this tokenized energy can be considered a, a valid of unit, yeah, which is managed by these devices together with the blockchain. So, and, and, and that, this is where it really gets interesting. So, because you have your solar power, we turn it into a kilowatt hour, and then you contribute it back to the network. If this network is now, for example, an energy community, yes, we have a representation of the complete settlement system of an energy community in average of up to 1,000 uh, users, uh, where we can do the complete settlement of the energy and the redistribution of energy on top of these tokens. And the token economic logic is embedded into this energy agent, which decides how to calculate, uh, uh, reconcile, settle, and so on the, the energy flow and the individual energy units within this community or between the unit uh, community and the main grid operator. So it's, so you, the other, the thing that sounds interesting to this one of among many is that it's optimized if a whole community uses it, but individual users can benefit from it just one, one off as well. So there are probably network effects from people using it, but that does not prevent any individual from benefiting from attaching this, um, the device and the, and the smart kind of, meter to their to their installation yes so for the individual user it's more or less about i would say 
intelligent usage and consumption of energy. So the, the system tells you, for example, hey, now is a very good time to turn on your heat pump in the morning hours. Yeah, maybe you should not turn it off uh, on automatically in the afternoon hours when the price for energy is so high. And we know we have a cloudy day, so you will not have enough energy from your solar uh, or solar battery. <clears throat> so do it this way, yes? Or use your dishwasher at this point of time. Or it also tells you, I think your fridge shows a very strange signature. Signature means uh, a fingerprint concerning its electricity behavior. Yes, maybe it's old, maybe it has to be maintained, maybe it's simply to be replaced. So these are the big benefits. But, and this is now the interesting thing, as the token is a generic token, and as the whole thing is built on top of Bitcoin, it's at the same time an off and on ramp into Bitcoin. Yeah, so for taking part in the system and delivering all the data we need to learn and optimize the system, we hand out an incentive token, which is called the Riddle. And uh, the Riddle is uh, traded on the uh, Blockstream network. So this means we can constantly turn this, for example, into to Bitcoins and vice versa. That's one of the interesting aspects. Well, on and, and um, on the token, which which um, we might as well get into that now, since you you've mentioned it, um, you receive the token for participation. And what is the, what are the uses of that token, or how does the token economy operate? Okay, so <clears throat> I, I told you that every device, which is related to energy consumption or production gets it tested against the network and has its own identity there. I told you also that we notarize the data in a regular uh, a way so that we can be sure that what we get from this device are relevant data with the necessary granularity, yes, with the necessary consistency and with the, uh, with the frequency, which means we can really uh, operate on this data. So the, the token economy is now around uh, uh, the next level. So when we go from the classical consumer level to the prosumer level, right? And for example, to an energy community, uh, it means an energy community tries to create surplus energy from renewable sources. This might be solar, this might be wind, this might be hydro. Huh? And <clears throat> surplus means they can sell this uh, energy either to each other, so to other community members, or to the grid operator, or uh, via some P2P uh, scheme also to, to, I would say, uh, local industries which need green power purchase agreements. So they have to give proof that they use a certain amount of energy, which comes from renewable sources. So, and uh, this is more or less immediately giving a, a value to the riddle because you can use the riddle so when you get rewarded, yes, you, you get more or less uh, a settlement currency and incentive currency, which you can use as the user to reduce your energy bill, or you invest it into an additional infrastructure when the energy community buys additional battery parks or battery capacity, or yeah, the third way is you use it as a local currency, which is also possible. So, and, and the last thing is that you have this capability of on and off ramp into crypto through, through, uh, the token exchange, token swaps and so on on the network. But there's, is there a network need for it? Cause you've given uses, maybe I didn't understand it well, uses that the individual or, or business can spend the token for a variety of ways, but is there a demand internal to the network for that token? Maybe that's yes. what I miss. Yes. So the first thing is um, the <clears throat> so um, I told you that uh, that the normal grid is blind behind all the things happening behind the smart meter. An energy community is more or less completely behind the smart meter. So 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 what we need is settlement for the for the energy community independent from the smart meter readings of the grid operator. Right? Otherwise, you cannot really uh, optimize the system as such. So, so the token is there to to get you, so to free you from the burden and the clumsiness of the grid settlement. The token is there to give valuation on the K 
capacity of the energy community network and the token is there uh, because it's backed against the value of energy yeah to make additional investments within the community into improving its own uh its uh, own infrastructure yeah? so it's one of the most interesting ways how you can do deep in and incentive systems so you really have an infrastructure which is normally a high value high yield infrastructure which is only done by uh, i would say state actors or by public private ventures and suddenly you create an uh, i would say purpose driven energy token system which can be completely decoupled from this and create value within a, a small demographic and uh, because this is uh, backed against uh, kilowatt hours yeah it has a true value which can then be used in uh, many many ways to to have direct access to this value and investments uh, for the infrastructure itself so the users of this new infrastructure finance the new infrastructure i think that's the most interesting thing you have an infrastructure which is decentralized out of the control of state actors and and huge investors yes or or i would say institutionalized investors uh, and you improve more or less the sovereignty the resilience and the uh, 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 overall capacity of of a private or local network when you say it's backed by energy I understand that energy is what production is what generates the token, but that that's it's correlated, but it's not really backed by it. Or 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 my my like you can't redeem the token for kilowatt hours. Yes, or you can use within the energy community. You say uh, at the end of the month when you do the settlement, right, for the energy. The system says, okay, you have uh, used 80% from the energy community, 20% from the grid. The grid uh, a kilowatt hour has a certain price tag and the internal energy community power has a certain price tag. And then you can take this token and more or less you get a perfect discount on your monthly energy bill. Yes. So as you can turn this token into a kilowatt hour, as this kilowatt hour can really be used in a process like your uh, uh, energy uh, settlement against the grid, uh, it has a clear value. And this clear and so, value of the kilowatt and, hour in the energy community. And so is that energy community then redeeming, has the, it would redeem that token or give you the consumer, the user, that discount effectively? Yes. They're the ones that would buy it. Yes, either internally or if the community decides to to uh, uh, sell the, the overcapacity to the grid network, then they have an inflow of regular fiat into the, I would say, the wallet or, or budget of the energy community, which then is a surplus which they can use on infrastructure. And so then is the other way to think about it, and maybe this is, this is the piece I was missing then, is that amount that they're selling that surplus that then becomes that correlates with the value of the real token because that 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 capital that comes in is then effectively backs that the the, the token that has been issued so far is that is that right yes yes so so we have two token systems so one is exactly as you explained yeah we call this the service token and then we have uh, uh you know this is the big the big challenge of uh, of all deep pins the services have to be somehow constant in, 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 in value because if you want people to consume the service, the price has to be somehow stable. If this fully is fully value, uh, fully volatile and the price goes too high, nobody will use your token to buy services. Right. So this is why we have this energy. I would, I would stay with the term energy backed token. Yeah. Which is our service token. And then we have the riddle token, which is a more speculative token. The real token gets issued according to the growth of the network, right? So the bigger the network gets, the more riddles get into circulation up to a, a, a threshold value. So it's a deflationary. So we have uh, 2.1 billion. That's the maximum of, 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 of uh, tokens, real tokens ever into existence. 
So, and uh, you get rewarded with these riddle tokens. But these riddle tokens are directly transferable to these service tokens. So when you are in the in the energy community and you hand over the data, then we reward you with the riddle token. And according to the value of the riddle token, you get more or less of the service token. The more service token you get, the cheaper your energy gets within the energy community. Yes, or the more interesting services you can consume from the overall network. I told you we have very generic services, like uh, we give you the capability to micro-invest into industrial projects. Yeah, so that's another use case. And when you say in, in, in energy community, can you help define what energy community is? Is that how big, how small? What, what does that mean to you? Okay. So I, I guess it's a, a very Eurocentric uh, thing at this point in time. So the European Commission decided, because of all the things that happened the last five years, I would say, that it's of uttermost important that the, the grid gets completely decentralized. And one way is beside coming up with way more innovative uh, uh, grid structures, which are very cost intensive, to empower more more decentralized and localized energy production. Yeah? So an energy community is, according to the European law, uh, uh, any understanding or agreement between at least two parties to create together energy and share the energy. In, in uh, Austria, Switzerland, uh, the Netherlands, Italy, France, more or less, it happens on the municipality level. So they try to aggregate all the participants who have solar rooftop, and then they tell them, okay, if we can manage your surplus in creation of uh, energy, and then take this uh, surplus in energy, either to feed it back to the network and get subsidies, or to better distribute it within the, the energy community, or to local businesses, yes, then you have the right to sell energy. So not only the, the grid operator, the net infrastructure operator is allowed to sell energy. In this time, private entities, individual persons, households, small and middle-sized uh, uh, enterprises, SMEs, are allowed to create and sell energy. That's an energy community. Fascinating. I had, did not know that regulation at, at, at all. So that, that is a key term that I think helps... Uh put this in a better context for for the non non Europeans or for the Americans um because the Americans I think you can you can sell your energy to the grid from a house you know part of the community you can just do it um as far as I know so now I'm I'm getting it really very interesting can you talk about the um the devices what do they cost how do you get them you know that enable all of this to take place yes so uh, let's start with the, the energy tracker. Um, smart meters uh, normally have globally standardized interfaces. Yes. So two are, I would say, are somehow quite well known to people who deal with it. One is a so-called optocoupler. It's an infrared interface. So you mount a device on your smart meter and then you can take the readings from the smart meter in real time via the infrared interface. So most most of the smart meters we know uh, have a frequency of 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, you can read the amount of energy which uh, flows through the meter in both directions. So it's bidirectional. That's very important, right? So you see how much you get from the grid, and you also see how much you put back into the grid. So besides this optocoupler infrared interface, which is called S1 or uh, uh, D0, S0, D0, you have a so-called MBUS. MBUS is meter bus. It's an industrial protocol, very well documented. And with two, with these two protocols, or one or the other, you have a direct connection to your smart meter. Okay, so this smart tracker reads everything from the smart meter and then transfers everything to the energy agent, which is this computational smart device at the edge. Okay. And, and this is one of the big problems because sometimes smart meters are, are, are below ground or they're far away of your apartment or far away of your building and so on. So you need a radio frequency protocol to transfer this, and this has to be reliable. So the smart tracker is the combination of uh, 
uh, itself a smart meter connected to an official smart meter. It's a radio frequency device and it's a hardware wallet. So whatever is read there yeah, or read there is immediately tokenized. And then we only transfer the uh, uh, reading of kilowatt hours as a token. And we also issue this amount of token to the Riddle network. So as this device has a hardware wallet, it has a clear identity. It can give proof to the network that it is allowed to transfer data. And it's also giving proof that the kilowatt hours can only have been produced there and nowhere else. So we have the kilowatt hour. We have the kilowatt hour as a value of unit. We have the proof of provenance. We have the proof of carbon offset because we know according to the provenance whether it's coming from a renewable source or not. And we can follow the full trail of these kilowatt hours from its generation at the smart meter or even at the inverter of the solar panel. Yes, wherever it goes there. And that's very important. So we have immediately new ways to, to create financial instruments on top of tokenized kilowatt hours. But we also have a carbon offset market. We have a, 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 a market for, for example, for how many of these renewable uh, uh, kilowatt hours are available uh, to, to industrial buildings and, and, and. Yes, so that's one part. Then we have the energy agent and the energy agent is constantly doing, taking business decision on top of this kilowatt hour price data, which are available and on top of the, of the blockchain to decide what to do best with this kilowatt hour as a value of unit. So consume it directly, store it in the battery, send it back to the network, send it to other members of an energy community or do, I don't know, something completely different with it. Okay, and uh, when you move this to the next level, for example, to an, to an industrial level or to a level of big buildings, it becomes very interesting. So worldwide, there's a strong trend that um, big compounds, big industrial buildings and so on have to be carbon neutral. So how can they do this? They need green power purchase agreements. Green power purchase agreements mean you buy from a grid operator a certain amount of kilowatt hours where you get the approval that the energy you buy is truly green. Then you have your monthly uh, energy bill and then you can say, okay, 80% of the energy which I used to, I don't know, run the escalator, yes, uh, 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 run the heating, the uh, HVAC, the cooling and so on with 80% green energy. So I fulfilled my carbon offset or, or, or uh, um, how can I say it's called uh, zero neutrality uh, targets. Yeah? You can only do this if you have the approval that the energy is really green. Now there's a problem. Everywhere there's only one thing, it's called greenwashing because we don't have enough green energy to play all this. So this means the grid itself cannot fulfill the main grid, the, the, the requirement in green energy, but the grid together with uh, the, 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 I would say, a, a smart grid or distributed grid and energy community grid and so whatever can fulfill this. But to fulfill this, you need finer granularity of data, at least at 15 minute or one hour intervals, because then you can do optimization, you can do forecasts, and you can really tell a big building operator if you want to use tomorrow, and I don't know, 300 uh, kilowatt hours of energy to operate your full building. Yes, the network and all the, all the green energy we will get from private sources will be capable to I uh, fulfill your requirement up to 60% or something like this. So again, this is only possible with our devices and our setup because we give uh, the proof of the kilowatt hours available. Today, in the future, with the forecasting and the optimization, uh, we give the proof of provenance. So we can give you a proof which is really very, very, very secure that the green energy comes indeed from renewable sources and we even tell you from where this energy is coming from. Um, and so, and how much do these devices cost? Are these are these retail devices? Are they enterprise devices? What what do you need? What's the outlay? And 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 how many are you do do um? What's your target deployment? 
Okay. So um, naturally, the devices have to be cheap. <laughs> yeah. So we built the 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 most less things are built on top of off the shelf devices. So we built three reference designs. And the last months we started to cooperate with uh, uh, producers of hardware. Yes, a Swiss company which is called Oratech, and then another company which is in Asia. It's called CE Studio with triple E, and uh, they produce devices which use our specifications or have built in, which is necessary for the hardware wallet, the so so called secure elements, which give a clear blockchain aligned identity to the devices. So how we do it, we build the reference designs, then we uh, are looking for uh, uh, hardware development and distribution partners. We check whether they have already something which is very close to our specifications, then we adopt the specifications, and then you can buy these devices on the regular market. The price range is very low. So the energy tracker is a device around 40 to 50 euros yeah i would say so a little bit uh cheaper and, and a little bit uh, more in, in us dollars um then the the energy agent which is a very powerful device so it's it's, it's as i told you something like uh, on the level of a raspberry pi 4 or 5 or an imx8 chipset it's around 100 euros and uh, the hardware walls we produce are super cheap Although they use secure elements, the price for a hardware wallet, which is embedded in either or the other, is around three to four euros. So absolutely affordable. And so then you do to be fully functional, you probably need all three of those devices, right? So you're talking about 150 euros more or less. Let's say that's the perfect setup, but you can also work only with the uh, energy agent. So you invest this 100 and then you get already so much uh, optimization data for your household that it pays off for energy. Community, and the it's not an issue. And the network is, is operational, right? So tell us about, you know, what is your rollout plan? Where do you think, how do you think this, the, it scales and, and where? Yes. So I would say this this consumer product is a global product. It can work everywhere, right? So everybody has more or less a smart meter and uses energy and wants to control uh, 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 home appliances. Um, um, the the what is important? The the blockchain part consists of two different parts. So we have a metadata blockchain which is built around Cosmos. And then we have a settlement blockchain, which is built around uh, uh, elements. D, so the the L2 of uh, built by Blockstream on top of Bitcoin, right? So that's the setup. The metadata going to the 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 uh, the, the this Cosmos uh, application we've built, and then the data stay on the energy agent. That's very important for GDPR. So we don't collect all the data somewhere else. So they stay secure inside of a CID format. It's practically an IPFS light client. And if you are willing to hand over your data for analytics and so on, so you get again rewarded by the network. Um, the, the, the identity of the devices, the so-called device at the station, happens uh, against, I would say, an NFT on, 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 on uh, Blockstream's liquid. Yeah. And uh, the issuing of the rewards and the issuing of the values also happens on uh, Blockstream Liquid. And uh, this is basically the setup. You have the energy agent, you connect it to your home Wi-Fi. Yeah. It, it registers itself or it tests itself against our network. It uh, has a very simple interface, uh, uh, how you connect it to the smart meter and how you connect it to home appliance devices. Yes. And from there on, the whole system runs automatically. We have a, a new consensus model, which we call proof of productivity. So uh, uh, these machines are constantly challenging each other. Are you really in the network? Are you really producing data? Have you really producing data for the last uh, uh, two months or three months? And are the data consistent and available? If this happens, so this consensus happens every two minutes, the system issues more real tokens. So this way the network grows with the participant. Concerning the rollout, 
first focus is on this energy community. We have around 10,000 registered communities in Europe. They are between 100 to 1,000 members. And, and uh, uh, I assume uh, that we can get uh, within a year at least 8, 8 to 10% of, of this market, yeah, which is uh, remarkable in size. So we would, we would manage around 100 gigawatt hours per year in, 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 in kilowatt productivity. We also work with electrolyzers. So because we have this energy and can give the provenance, for example, you, you, you work with industrial electrolyzers, which also have to prove that the green gas is only produced with green power. And, and, and this is then also an amplification factor because then we move from the individual level to the industrial level. And everywhere we use the same kind of devices and the same kind of logic. So. And to get that, that rollout, I mean, it's terrific. You have a very clear target market. You know, you have clear value to add to them. The price point is not expensive. Um, is there a business development team? I just out of curiosity, how does that actual rollout and that actual sales cycle operate? Some of the deep in networks have historically been focused on the supply side and have been less good at getting the demand and the actual adoption taken care of. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in your, your strategy there. Yes. So <clears throat> there are physical devices involved, which is also as, as, is always complicated, right? So if you have a clear DeFi product, it's way easier because you don't have to take care about this. So we, 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 we focus on these households and especially energy communities because there we have this, this, this network effect uh, which through the word of mouth. So once you have one community, it's easy to get two or three. Once we had three, it was easy to get to 50 and so on. Yeah. That's, that's, that's one part of it. On the other side, we address the, the, the steadily growing, uh, uh, market of, uh, home IoT device developers. And I don't know whether you've ever heard there are two projects. One is called Tasmota and the other one is called Home Assistant. And these are huge projects. So Home Assistant is the second biggest project on GitHub, right? So. It's, it's really remarkable how many people have now an interest into smart homes. And more or less, these are the two directions we run. Yes. So we, we address more or less this, this home IoT, uh, builders market, and then we address the energy community market. And, um, this works out up to this point very well. The one big challenge is when we do want to do more smart things with the energy agent and the smart meter in Europe. Sometimes it requires an electrician or certified electrician to do certain setups. So this is now the third part we start to work on that we are coming up with educational uh, uh, services to educate uh, certified electricians to set up our system. But they are also at the same time ambassadors and, and taking our system to the market. So, so, so what you see is we have a really a deep in. It's, it's really a completely new infrastructure. We have a very interesting tokenomic system, which has real world purpose. And it has, uh, it also supports up to a certain point the necessary, I would call, uh, speculative, uh, pontinomic part. Yeah. So the higher the value of the riddle, the more we can invest into the, the service token, the more we invest to the service token, the faster the network grows. And we have the deepness of no other stack because we built this hardware down to the level of a CQL element. This, it's a fascinating project. Tell us, let's back up a little bit and I think talk about your background. How did you get here? How did you come up with this as a project? What kind of led you to this, to this place? <clears throat> so, okay. Um, the, the, the real foundation was, uh, founded, uh, uh, one and a half years ago. It's a spin out of a company called Riddle and Code. Riddle and Code was founded six years ago, but it started way earlier. So I, I'm a research scientist and a social economist. Yes. Uh, I was, I would say since the beginning in, in, it's called heterodox, uh, uh, uh economy. So this is non mainstream economy. Yeah. And uh, uh, very, very early on, so I would say already in 2000, I started to be extremely interested into digital money. 
Yeah. So these were the ego days. I, 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 I know this is a, this is really historic part. So, okay. I was always interested also in art and I thought art is moving more and more into the digital realms. But although every digital or every art has a, a certain aspect of digital art, meanwhile, even if it's just about communication, digital art has no value. So, so uh, I was starting to work and say, okay, how can I give uniqueness to digital art? And, and you know, there's no difference between the original and the copy. <laughs> That's very important. But I had this kind of epiphany where I said, oh, interesting. If I take the image and if I hash the image and assign the image and I have a copy where I have the signature and I can give proof that this signature validates against the public key and the private key I have, then I can say, okay, it might be that I have one of uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of digital copies, but I'm the only one who can prove some kind of ownership or, uh, or proof of origin. So through this project, I, I met Ian Grigg, the father of the Ricardian contracts, and he introduced me around, I think, 2004 or something like this or earlier to the, uh, uh, this discussion board for... Uh, uh, cryptographic finance. Yeah. And I, I was staying there and I took part in it actively till I read the famous white paper, uh, Satoshi's white paper. This was the first time that I didn't understand something in my life. Really, it, it was a big challenge. And I took part <laughs> like other people. Yeah? Nobody really understood this, this protocol at the beginning. Yes. So till 2010 or 2011, many people tried to recode it <laughs> to understand what's really going on. Yes. What is really the blockchain? How are the chains intertwined? You know, because you use a signature, which is of no importance for the contract at the moment of the specific receipt. It's just of importance for the upcoming next one. Yes. So some of the things were not very intuitive and it really took a year or a year and a half till some community really understand the peculiarities of it. So. I wrote my own version in Lua and Python, and then I completely understood it really in, in the deepest detail possible. But I was more fascinated. I thought it's fantastic what you can do with digital assets now, or what you will be capable to do in the future. But can I not take part of this and have the same logic used on physical objects? And it took me more than four years to come up with a solution. I cannot hash a physical object. It's not possible, right? This would require transmutation. But what I can do is I can bring the blockchain as close as possible to the physical object. And this is where all this started. So I, I realized I can take so-called secure elements, so special purpose cryptographic uh, chips, yes, FPGAs or, 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 or um, 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 secure elements, trusted platform models and so on. And I can take them, rewrite the firmware and interconnect them with other hardware or boards. And this is what I did then for three years. And <clears throat> at the same time, this, this, this blockchain thing became more and more important. And because I had such a deep understanding going beyond the capabilities of a classical hardware wallet, I think in, in, in 2000, I have to think 2014 or something, I started to work with Swiss banks very early on to, to more or less build institutional hardware wallets. And while building the institutional hardware wallets, I realized more and more, it's even more interesting if I could use this in an industrial setup, for example, to give the proof that a certain amount of oil was flowing through a wolf. <laughs> yes. And then have a proof of the productivity, the proof of, of origin and so on. And in, in 2017, 18, uh, I started to turn this into a business. Then we did a lot of projects for well-known other projects. So we built the first hardware wallet for IOTA, for example. Uh, we, we built uh, a first hardware wallets for the German car industry. So we did a big project, for example, for the Ocean Protocol. And when we did it with Tesla or for Tesla cars, we pumped their value double. Yeah, so the, their value doubled for several weeks. And this was the point where I realized we don't participate in this value generation, which is a big problem. So we didn't have deep pins. So we do something on a completely different front, which is not valuated. And uh, then I said, okay, if you want to do something like this, even if it's with hardware, you have to have your own token. 
And then we started to work on this. Yeah. And now we are where we are. Now this is called Deepin. And, and I would say we have a very, very interesting proposal to the market because it's a true Deepin. It's a deep stack. It's purposeful and it has a undeniable applicability. Yeah, I mean, listen, it's a terrific background. I mean, it also seems like if I sort of read that one way, you know, that is the perfect background to you. The technology background that you brought to this is perfectly suited for what you're doing, right? You needed the hardware wallet experience. You needed the energy experience. You needed the, all these different pieces to come together. The other thing that I think interesting, I see this with some of the other deep end projects is that you couldn't have created this many years earlier, right? A couple of things had to come together, both on the software side, as well as the hardware side to allow, the, and, and frankly, on the energy, the energy community side, the regulation side also, right? Yes. All these things kind of had to converge in order to make what you're building kind of possible to, to be adopted and deployed and built, right? Precisely. Yeah, that, which is which is interesting because I think that's true for certainly a very true with you. It's definitely true with a number of other deep in projects, but that's what makes it timely. It also shows how early we are because this is all just beginning now as all these factors have just converged. I think deep in is kind of attractive, but people are still coming to understand what it is because it is so early and hasn't been around long because all these pieces haven't been together. Um, in, in terms of Deepin overall, are there other projects you pay attention to or like or think are solving interesting problems that you um, do you, you, you think are, are worth mentioning? Uh, yes, naturally. So uh, there are two things. Yes. So I, I, I'm constantly keeping an eye on Peak uh, because Peak does similar things, but more generic, and they don't have this hardware background, right? So everything is related on more or less on, on, on a DID or a simple software identity, while our identity is more or less rooted in the hardware itself. It's, it's, it's a completely different game. Yeah? So, but uh, the market is in parts overlapping and it's very interesting to, to observe this. The second project is some project I, I consider by purpose closer to us. It's WeatherXM. I think this is one of the most purposeful deep hints I know. Naturally, I'm uh, 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 also following IoTech. Yeah, I mean, how could I not? And uh, uh, um, another, in, uh, maybe I don't know whether I should call it uh, a tipping or not. Uh, the Energy Web Foundation was always interesting, but they had this very clear industrial focus and a strong focus on on, on carbon offset and certification markets. And uh, uh, I'm also following some of the, I would say, newer newer projects concerning uh, uh, everything related to scaling of networks because scaling is a big issue, right? So I'm deeply following Solana. I highly appreciate Celestia. So Ethereum, yes, but only in part. I I think that applicability of blockchain is now or will be more important than only scalability or algorithmic power. Yeah. So, you know, we've been working with, so we use interesting technologies too. So probably trees instead of Merkle hashes, yeah, because it's easy to do, use them decentralized. Uh, we use collective signing, yes, on top of, of, of multi-party computation. We also experimented with zero knowledge, but that's, that's also a learning. Sometimes the most interesting technology is really not the most uh, uh, appropriate one, right? So it's, it's beautiful. It's an interesting narrative, but from a perspective of applicability, it might be too complex. It might uh, overwhelm developers. You cannot really uh, 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 transfer the domain knowledge and, 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 and. So... When you ask me what I'm looking for, I'm looking at these specific projects, and then I'm looking uh, a lot on on scalability technologies. Super interesting. Well, listen, you've you've mentioned Bitcoin a couple of, of times and talking about you know kind of core technologies, and that's kind of what got you into this whole space. Um, any projections? Where do you think Bitcoin is at the end of 2024? Any any views in terms of, of price? 
Got you got to got to put everyone on the spot. Yeah, yes, you you know, yeah, this is no investment advice. <laughs> it has to be said all the time. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, um, um, what we do is audit it, so I'm careful. No, I'm quite confident that we will break the 100k barrier. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I'm, I I would certainly agree with you on that. Um, well, listen, that's that's uh, really interesting. How do people get involved with Riddle? How do they buy devices if they're part of these energy communities? How do they find you? How do they follow the network? How do they participate? What um what what kind of how do people just get involved here? Yes, so everything we do is uh, open openly documented on GitHub. Naturally, we we have a, 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 a homepage. It's very easy. It's a real.io, so R D D L without an E at the end, so shortened, uh, .io. And uh, there are all the other links, and it's easy to get uh, all the necessary information. And naturally, it's a project meant for participation also on the development level. Right, excellent. So it's open for other other development partners to participate and to, to add, add value and add features. Yes, absolutely. We also try to be integrative to 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 integrate with other chains. So 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 one example I, I think I mentioned because we did it already earlier. It might make sense that we use the data for analytics and then you create a, a data stack on Ocean, right? So so we set up everything. We have a development pipe where you start on our chain and then you end in a in in a, in an Ocean market. Uh, and this is, by the way, the last thing I wanted to mention. Because we are on liquid, and because liquid is more or less uh, Bitcoin with colored coins, or with 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 uh, how can I say coins with attributes, what we normally do when we integrate with other blockchains is we create a common pool of currencies, we lock them, and then we issue a synthetic token on liquid. So when you want to use uh, the other blockchain or its services, you can pay with Riddle. The riddles get immediately exchanged against the synthetic token of the other chain. Then you get the real chain token and you can settle the transactions on the third party chain. This is from my point and from my perspective, this is going to be one of the most interesting aspects of the thing we are setting up right now. To have an inter-blockchain mechanism via synthetic tokens on a Bitcoin L2. Yeah, that that is super interesting, and that is a uh, a whole technology in of itself outside of what your the core kind of energy component that you're doing, right? Yes, also a perfect way maybe to to connect somehow to fluence, yes, and uh, getting their proofs of yep. uh, computation. <laughs> would love to. Would love to figure out a way for for fluence to to integrate without a doubt. That would be terrific. Um, well, listen, thank you for being on. It's been great to have you. And I'd love to have you on when we can talk about examples of some energy communities that have scaled up and have deployed. I'm, I'm sure that's not far away. So certainly excited to see the deployment and success. It's a super important project. Um, and uh, I think solving you know, a, a globally important um, you know issue. So that is uh, very exciting to see the deep in and the crypto network, and crypto world moving that direction. So uh, thank you for the efforts in that. And thanks for being on the podcast. And I will um, have you on again. We'll, we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Tom, for the opportunity. Yes. See you soon. Bye bye. <laughs>